Hey, welcome to today's uh, WTF is Modern Monetary Theory. I am still reading uh, Make Me Money Work For Us, um, MMT Can Save America, written by L. Randall Ray. And there is still, uh, you can still uh, sign up for uh, Real Progressive's um, uh, book club uh, group. Uh, you can go to realprogressives.org and <clears throat> sign up there. Uh, we are going over that book. Uh, we had three experts uh, over the course of three weeks. I forget who's going to be on for next week, but last night there was, um, I, don't know, I forgot who that was too. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but the last week will be El Randall Ray himself as far as, um, uh, as far as um, taking questions and stuff of that nature. Anyway, so if I if I figure out who uh, who was last night's and who was next week's, then uh, I'll let you guys know <laughs> tomorrow. Anyway, so getting back to the book, I am so no, actually I think I'm in chapter two now. Uh, I think hard for me to tell these days. Anyway, so but anyway, I'm at the uh, part that says F, uh, not F. How banks print now at. Yeah, anyways, it is going uh, A to, I'm not sure which letters it, it ends on yet, but right now I'm at F. So how banks create money. In modern economies, banks play a special role. They are typically chartered by the government uh, to undertake uh, specific sanctions, uh, sanctioned activities. One must have a charter. To be sure, the lines between banks and shadow banks have become increasingly blurred over the past, over the past three or four decades. Banks are normally subject to special rules and oversight by government authorities. They also uh, have special access to lending by the central bank, and in most cases, or in most countries, excuse me, a large portion of their liabilities is government-issued. What that means is that bank liabilities are special, they are liquid as defined in Chapter 1, and there is no default risk on government-issued uh, in, uh, insured excuse me, deposits. This helps uh, to make bank deposits widely acceptable as safe uh, assets to hold. At the same time, banks benefit from these government-backed stops and, uh, lending by central bank and insurance from the Treasury. Banks can issue liabilities that pay lower interest rates because they are deemed to be safer. By the way, this first part will be going onto my TikTok at Calvin six uh, Calvin Taylor six six six, and the rest will obviously go to my YouTube channel. Anyway, at WTF is MMT on YouTube. Anyway, uh, let's see three. Uh, there may also be perhaps unintentional benefits to the biggest banks that are considered to be too big to fail. In quotes. The perception that government will always rescue a big bank will allow it to issue even un, even in un, insecured, uh, I'm sorry, uninsured, uninsured you know, liabilities at low at low interest rates. That is based on what happened to GFC, I believe. Anyways, uh, they were betting it. Uh, they were betting on it through uh, derivatives that Larry Summers fought tooth and nail to stop from being regulated. Anyway, so people figure that figure that no matter what the bank does, the government will bail it out, you know, bail it, bail it, and them out. Further, uh, banks rock, uh, rock, or bank stock. She's prices will tend to be higher if investors believe there is little chance the government will allow it to fail and it might be able to get away with riskier behavior such as running lower capital ratios and buying riskier assets. If it is thought to be too big to fail, in turn, banks are too, uh, that are too big to fail may be able to offer loans at lower interest rates since their costs can be lower, giving them an advantage over other lenders. These are issues of concern to bank regulators, and we will not pursue them in detail, but in the next chapter, 
Polls discussed the possibility that too much lending, especially risky lending, could lead to financial crisis. For all these reasons, banks play a special role in the financial system, and the biggest banks may be deemed to be even more special than the small ones. This is why government pays special attention to them, protecting and regulating them. As we will explain in detail, private bank deposits are created mostly when banks make loans. Private banks use their reserve accounts at the central bank when they need to clear checks, that is, make payments to one another. Bank reserves, in turn, are created by central bank loans to, to private banks. Both private money in the form of the uh, bank deposits and government money, money, no, uh, money in the form of reserves are created by keystrokes, something we cannot run out of. Historically, what, uh, what are called commercial banks, those that specialize in making short-term loans and issuing demand deposits, have been the major lenders to private business, especially to smaller and medium-sized firms to finance the production uh, process. They have also been the major players in what we call the payments, payments system as their deposits were used to make most payments, indeed the loan making activities and the deposit provision services have been closely linked. Let's explore that relationship. As we have previously mentioned, deposits are created when banks make loans. If commercial banks make loans in the finance production, they are created, uh, creating the deposits that are used to hire labor and other resources used in the production process. Those deposits then circulate the output that is pr produced, providing the means of payment used by households to buy the output from the firms that paid their wages to produce the output. Incomes generated by production are received in the form of commercial bank deposits and these can be used to buy the consumer goods produced. We will use this view of the relation between commercial banking and production to trace the creation of private money through the loan making process. Of course, the real world has always been more uh, complicated and complexity has increased greatly over the past few de decades due to tremendous financial innovation. The biggest commercial banks have moved away from the traditional lending business and much of the payments system have uh, sorry, now takes place outside the commercial banks. The lines between commercial banks and investment banks that traditionally finance investment projects undertaken by firms are no longer clear cut. And the rise of a wide variety of types of financial activity that are referred to with the rather all encompassing term shadow banking has further complicated matters. Still, our understanding of money creation can be improved by studying the process through which traditional commercial banking financial or finance, finance production and the majority of banks in terms of number, at least in the U.S., where, where we still have thousands of small banks, still behave this way, even though the behemoths that account for most of the volume of assets held by banks do not. So how do banks create money? We now turn to examination of money creation by private financial institutions. We do not need to imagine money as mana from heaven, mana from heaven, but rather see it as the creation of purchasing power controlled by the banker. We will begin with a simple description of the money creation process and will gradually introduce more complexity. Models are often used by economists to simplify uh, exposition. By shipping away details, we can focus on the most important processes. Unfortunately, if too many details are removed, a model can be misleading. For example, 
A lot of conventional eco economic models have leave money out of the analysis entirely. Modeling simply, or sorry, um, modeling simple uh, economies that function without money. When money is then added later, it plays no important role. We are not going to do that, however. We will begin our model uh, by assuming that money is important. Indeed, the production process itself be must begin with money. A firm that wishes to engage in production must first obtain money in order to purchase inputs, uh, labor, uh, intermediate uh, goods, and raw materials to the production process. Further, we will assume that the firm engages in production in order to sell the output for money. The hope, of course, is to make profits, much uh, which excuse me, which requires that the goods or services are sold for more money than the firm had to spend on the inputs. All of this probably sounds obvious to you as it captures features uh, captures features of the real world. However. Uh, believe it or not, most models used by economists do not begin and end with money. For the purposes of our model, we also want to avoid any infinite regress problems. It would be easy enough to presume, presume that the firm begins the production process with money it has saved from previous sales and output. The problem with starting there is that we have no, we have not explained how the firm had financed the production of the output that it already sold for money. If we were simply to assert that the previous production was financed by sales that occurred even earlier, we've got a chicken and a problem. Where did where did money come from in the first place? Hence, we will begin our model with a firm that wishes to produce output but has no hoarded money to purchase inputs to production. This allows us to examine how money gets created in the first place. The firm will approach a bank for a loan. Note also that we do not want to rely on an infinite uh, regress argument regarding the loan. It is frequently assumed that the banker takes in deposits and then lends them out. That creates another chicken and egg problem. Where did the deposit come from? One response could be that someone deposited check or cash into the deposit account. But that would just raise another question about the origins of the check or cash that was deposited. So if we were so if we are to begin at the beginning, we must start with the creation of money. Following from the discussion in Chapter 1, we know that money is simply a record of debt. Bank deposits are liabilities of banks and are created when they make loans. Really, all that the bank needs to do is to create the deposit account of the borrower. In the case we will examine, the producing, the producing firm is the borrower and the money is needed to begin the production process it is created by its bank. The bank will hold the loan, the note, which is the liability of the firm as its asset while it credits the while it credits the demand deposit of the firm. The producer wanting to hire labor and to produce resources needed for the production process submits a uh, prospe prospectus to the banker. While the banker looks at the past performance as well as wealth pledge as collateral, most important is the likelihood that the producer's prospects are good. Assessing credit worthiness is called underwriting. If the banker believes the producer will be able to make payments on the loan, a loan is advanced. In the old days, the bank would actually print banknotes to lend. And today, the bank simply credits the deposit of the firm. In return, the firm uh, signs the loan document, uh, the note held by the bank, promising to make interest and principal payments to the bank. The firm will use its uh, created deposit to purchase inputs to, to the production process. Since we want to make or want to focus rather on bank creation of money, for our simplest model, assume there is no cash. All payments are made using the bank's deposit accounts. Households simply labor and other resources used by the firm 
and they purchase the firm's output as consumers. They receive and use bank money, deposits of their wages to make such purchases. For our simplest model, we will assume that there is only one bank, one household, and one firm. The firm hires labor and purchases raw materials in order to produce output. Payments are made by writing checks on the deposit account at the bank. Recipients of the firm spending deposits the checks at the bank, uh, resulting in cred uh, credits to the household's own deposit account and debits to the firm's account. Note that all these transactions can be done electronically on the balance sheet of the bank. There is no need for physical checks. Once the firm has finished producing goods or services for sale, they are sold to the households. This reverses the transactions. The household writes a check on its deposit account and the firm deposits this in favor of its own account. The bank debits the household's deposit and credits the firm's deposit. In the final step, the firm repays its original loan by writing a check on its deposit account. The bank debits the firm's account and returns the firm's note. The loan is repaid and the firm can burn or shred the evidence of its IOU. Note that when the loan is repaid, the bank's, de uh, the bank's deposits are struck from the bank's balance sheet too. Both the firm and the bank are simultaneously redeemed as discussed earlier. Obviously, we have presented a very simple model of a loan and a deposit creation process. We assumed only one firm, one household, and one bank. The firm and the household use the same bank. The firm's spending on labor and raw materials purchased from the household equaled the household's spending on the firm's output, meaning the firm earned no profits and the household did no saving. Did no save. Oh, did not save, excuse me. The firm was able to repay the bank exactly the amount it had borrowed, so the bank earned no interest. A more realistic model would need to take account of numerous complications, including profits, saving, interest, cash, withdrawals, bank reserves, intermediate production produced by other firms, and bank capital. But even this example shows loan and deposit creation procedures and highlights what happens when payments are ma made using bank deposits. However, because we actually live in, in a world with many banks, households, and firms, payments typically involve at least two banks, uh, banks clear accounts with one another by canceling netting claims against another uh, one another or by using deposits in correspondent banks. Net clearing among banks is usually done on the central bank's balance sheet. We will expand our model to include two banks. We will assume that the banks have reserve accounts at the central bank that they use to, to make payments and eat to each other for clearing. Reserve accounts are likely are like checking accounts held at the central bank. Assume the first uh, firm uh, assume the firm uses uh, bank one while the household uses bank two. When the firm writes a check on bank one to make a payment. To the household, the check is deposited in bank two. Bank two presents the check to bank one for clearing. The central bank debits the reserves of the bank one and credits reserves of bank two. When the household then writes a check on bank two to make a payment to the firm, the process is reversed. Bank one presents that check to bank two for clearing. The central bank credits the reserve of bank one and debits the reserve of bank two. How do banks get reserves in the first place? Remember that revert, re, uh, reserves are simply deposits created by the central bank. Just as, a, just as a private bank creates deposit in favor of the borrower when it makes a loan. A central bank creates the reserves in favor of the borrower may, uh, bank when it makes a loan. As mentioned above, central bank Banks also create reserves when they purchase assets such as garments or bonds. So the central bank can simply cre uh, credit the reserves of borrowing banks or holding the, I the, the bank's IOU. The central bank generally charges a low interest rate called the discount rate in the U.S. for, for such loans. Central banks routinely lend reserves as banks need them to, for clearing to make sure that the payments system functions smoothly. Otherwise, bank checks would not clear in a timely fashion, which at the extreme would 
which at the extreme would endanger, uh, yeah, endanger what is called a par clearing. This is accepted by one bank of a check drawn on another bank at par or dollar for dollar as we saw earlier. <clears throat> Today, most payments are made electronically, taking the form of electronic credits and, deb and deb debits to accounts. You, uh, you can access your bank account via the internet and instruct your bank to debit your account to make a payment to your, your utility bank or company, rather. Since your utility company probably uses a different bank, your bank will need to make the payment for you by instructing the central bank, the Fed, in the USA to debit its account and credit the account of the utility company's bank. Techno technological, a word I can never really say very well, but even change has shortened the time required for such transactions as central banks are keenly focused on making sure the payment system functions smoothly and quickly. Like any banker, the Fed or the Bank of England or any central bank at any country keystrokes uh, money into existence. There we go. Central bank money takes the form of reserves or paper notes created to make payments for customers, banks, or the national uh, national treasury, or to make uh, purchases for its own account, treasury securities, or Mortgage back securities, for example, a central bank cannot run out of keystrokes. To conclude our inquiry so far, where does money come from? When you go to the ball game, let us say the free uh, the the Fenway Park to watch Boston play uh, Boston play Tampa Bay baseball teams, and oh, baseball teams, and five runs are scored in the sixth inning. Do you wonder where the where the, key, the, the the scorekeeper got those five runs to post up? Does the scorekeeper have to borrow them from somebody or tax them away from Boston to award it award to Tampa Bay? Of course not. As you can see, I'm not really much of a sports person. Anyway, in the old days, the scorekeeper would have to sort sort through a stack of numbers of cards to find the one reading five to pin to the scoreboard. If she or he ran out, she or he might have to take out a large marker pen and create a new one. Today, the scorekeeper just uses a finger to strike the number five on a on a keyboard. <clears throat> she or her, uh, she or he cannot run out. Where do the runs come from? Keystroke, keystrokes. Where do they re represent? Scorekeeping, tallying, accounting. Today's banks operate in the same manner. Where do the deposits come from? Keystrokes. Scorekeeping, tallying, accounting. If you receive a wage payment from your employer, a bank keystrokes a positive entry to your deposits. At the same time, your employer's deposits are marked down by the same amount. By the same amount. Where do banks get those deposits to credit to your account? Keystrokes. And where do the deposits debited from your employer's account go? Keystrokes and keystroked away. Where does a bank get the 180000 it lends to you to buy a house? Where does the central bank get, to get the reserves it lends to private banks? Keystrokes. It makes no more sense to worry about, wait, it makes no more sense to worry about how, about those questions that it does to worry about where the keystrokes found the five runs to credit to Tampa Bay in the sixth inning. In baseball, we call it scorekeeping. Banks also call it also to score, but we call that accounting. And the accounting is in money, no, not runs. <clears throat> okay, so for tomorrow, I will be doing um, G, as it looks like. Uh, why does government sell bonds? That'll be on page 54 if you have the book. And again, if you don't have the book, go to realprogressive.org, uh, go to the bookstore and purchase it there. And if you're in Canada, uh, you can special order through Spartacus.net, I believe. Um, anyways, uh, thanks for listening uh, again. This will go on to TikTok as a as a clip. You can come up, come over here and watch and watch and listen the whole thing. Thank you for listening, and I've reestablished my, my my Patreon, kind of more of a rant, it's just my opinion sort of thing, so 
I'll I'll place that that uh link at the bottom as well if you choose to come over and say hi and maybe donate a dollar or some all that. Anyways, for now, peace out for now. And again, uh, I will. Let me just got to double check something. Hold on. Okay, uh, just I saw who was the guest from last night, and we'll be in the next few weeks for the uh for the uh, for the uh real progressive um. A book club uh again featuring um making money work for us how mmt can save america by l ronda ray and last night was eric tamoyne i believe his name is uh next will be on the on the february 6th will be uh yiva narcissian and on the day on february 13th the last one will be l ronda ray himself so if you are interested, you can go to realprogressives.org, look at the calendar, sign up for uh for the book club, uh, and you may be able to get a free book out of the whole deal. Uh, but either way, if you are interested in, in MMT and anything MMT related, then I suggest you be, you uh, become part of the organization, support the organization, and become a part of the book club. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to say? Uh, and the macaroni and cheese next one. Uh, what the heck was his name? Decided to stop so, so many times. Uh, Aaron Good or at Aaron Good uh, on Twitter. Um, uh, wrote a book called American Exceptional uh, Exceptionalism or Exceptional Exception. Uh, he also had you can get that on Amazon as well. Uh, so he also does a podcast under the same name. So I think that's going to be uh, at 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern on Saturday. By the way, check it out. Go to realprogressive.org for that. Uh, but for now, thanks for listening. Um, and once again, uh, please follow me on TikTok at Calvin Taylor 666. If I get a thousand more followers, I get to go live. So that's my plan in regards to that. Anyways, for now, thanks for listening. Peace out for now. Uh, and again, uh, go to org. Peace out.